So the Bible is what you need to start reading more and learning from. And it's hard to understand if you just read it line by line, uh, as even as a young person, you know, you, you need to focus on are in here. So I think somebody needs to take the good principles for every person and do it more. Some have done that. But some of the children's books, you know, they just talk about, you know, the story of David and Goliath and Moses and the children of Israel and Elijah the prophet or, I don't know, Jesus and John the Baptist and Jesus, you know, and the simple gospels. That's good. But the ways of uh, the laws of wisdom, the laws of success, the laws of how to live a good life, they're all in here. But if you look yourself, you know, and it'd be a bit hard to find them. It would take you a long time to read 850,000 words, or 860,000, however many there are, 1,189 chapters, almost 1,200 chapters of the Bible. And how many thousands of statements and sentences? Maybe, uh, well, if there's 1,200 chapters, then there's going to be like six figures, hundreds of thousands of statements, of sentences. So it would take, a, it would take forever. It would take a long time. So... Uh, I've seen the children's books, and I think that somebody needs to write out a plan for the young generation. Maybe it will be me if I have enough help, because <laughs> I'm seeing it right now. And begin to lay out, like, what to do in this part of your life, what to do in that, you know? And uh, if I could find other books that have already been written, because I'm so busy, I'll incorporate them into my, you know, curriculum. Because if someone else has done the work, well, let's use theirs. Right? To save time. <laughs> if I think, oh, I got to write a book for babies and a book for young people and teenagers and young business people and, oh, students. And uh, that's going to take some time. I was meditating as I was coming here on the road, if you could call it roads, and uh, call them roads, I don't know, uh, but you can somehow roll over them and get to a place which is somewhat helpful. The rest I'm not sure. But the Lord, uh, well I'm reminded of a prophecy I gave that the roads will be developed. So, yeah, so it's kind of, it's kind of has happened. I was thinking about uh, something a man of God, uh, a dear, powerful man of God said, that he got a burden for a certain group of people, so he built something for them. And I won't tell all the details, but he said every time he sees the affliction on a certain, uh, a certain affliction on people, it really disturbs him. I understand that. So he's at the place in his ministry in life where he was able to um, uh, build that thing. So I thought, I thought, can I do that? No, not now. Would I want to do that later? Maybe not. So I started to think, what is it that is the burden that God's giving me? What's my assignment? Everybody lift your hand and say, Lord, show me what exactly it is I'm supposed to do with my life. Oh, yes. According to your plan and will. According to your plan and will. Say that, according to your plan and will, Lord. And that's all you can ever do. That's it. End of story. You only have so much time. I know young people think you have all the time in the world, but really you don't. 
So you got to get on with the program from the, from the early part of your life. Say amen. amen. Yeah. Say, I'll do that. I'll do that. Oh, yes. Wow, you guys are really something. I'm, I'm amazed. So I begin to meditate, like, what do I feel burdened about? In fact, the Lord spoke to me again this morning a few things that he wants me to do personally. And I thought, oh, God, this is work. But we're going to do it. I, I see the wisdom in what you're saying. Another very important thing is wisdom. Somebody write that down, the word wisdom. Sagesse, that's French, sorry. What is it in Swahili? Wisdom. Okay, yes, Hakima. Write that down, Hakima. Wisdom. Write this down, Proverbs. Proverbs. The book of Proverbs in this Bible. Now again, if you read every verse, you'll get some things out of it because it's point by point. But I still think somebody needs to explain it a bit to people. This is work. If it becomes my job to do, I'll gladly do it with God's help. If it's just me, myself, by myself, I don't know if I can do it. If God will send me the help, thank you, Lord. I'm giving the Lord a challenge right now. Yeah, I'm speaking this. If you give me the help, I can do anything. But without the help, how can I get it done? It's very disturbing. So first of all, you have to know your, your assignment. What it is God wants you to do. Write that down somewhere. Make a note of that. Say, I, you got a tablet. You could type it in, son. How old are you? Twelve. He's got a tablet with the Bible software. He's 12 years old, you see. Jesus was 12 years old, and he knew what he was supposed to be doing. In fact, he got lost from the family, and then the parents were mad at him. Like, where, why did you go there? Why didn't you stay with us? He said, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? He already knew what he was supposed to be doing. So life is very strange if you don't know what you're doing. And once you know what you're doing, you need to begin to get the best of the best of everything to make a good expression of it. We are called to be the expression of God. But first you have to know what you're supposed to be doing. That's number one. If you don't know, you can't do anything really except survive. And the Lord sees people just surviving, stuck, you know, just surviving. It's so sad. It's so sad. So I thought, what begins to disturb me? What disturbs me? And I begin to think about some things. I want to do this. I feel burdened about this. I feel compassion for this. Make a note of this. Your assignment will flood your heart with ideas. The anointing that God has given you. <laughs> hey, she grabbed that baby. Yeah, you're smart. That baby's going to go everywhere. Take care of that baby. He, even the baby wants to go somewhere. You know, they don't want to stay sitting. They want to move. They want to find something. They want to discover something. That's a good sign. You need to be like that. Go looking for what you want. Go find it. You never get nothing by staying home. Unless you're doing a business online or on your telephone and you're making money from the house, hello? If you stay home, you don't learn anything. You don't get anything. You have to go out there in the world and find out where everything is. And by that, by doing that, you begin to uh, walk into a process of discovery of what your calling is, what your assignment is. You begin to see what you like, what you don't like, what burdens you, what doesn't trouble you. Some things are not your concern. 
And the last thing you want to do is be concerned about everything that's not your business. None of your business, then let it be none of your business. You say, no, that part, that thing, I don't care. Huh? Like somebody's supposed to be arranging something. I told them, I said, don't bother me about this. Do it, get it done, figure it out, you do it. Don't bother me. Don't bother me about this. I'm busy. You do it. Take care of it. Handle it. Let it be done. I don't need to, I can't do everything. You know? You also need to know what you're supposed to be doing and what you're not supposed to be doing. Amen. Don't waste my time with foolish things, you know? Things that, you know, you don't know. You know figure it out. Or find someone who knows. Guess what? Here's a secret. Some things you don't know how to do it. Find someone out. Find someone that knows how to do it. Some people have very limited sight. I can understand that. Very limited vision. Well, get with people that have big vision. And then you'll go, oh, there's a whole big world out here that I need to go into. I don't need to stay where I am. So I can see a few things that disturb me, that trouble me, that I think about, that I want to do. And the Lord spoke to me this morning. A few things, you know. Let me give you a great scripture. 3 John 2. It says, Beloved, that's talking about me. Beloved Thomas. Beloved whoever you are. Beloved Gaius. Who's Gaius? We don't know him. He lived back then. Gone. Never met him. Don't know who he is 2,000 years ago. So guess what? I don't care about Gaius at all. Whatever his life was, it's of no concern to me. I wasn't there. He's not here. Then it doesn't matter. And God, when he spoke the principle, beloved, he wasn't just talking to one person when John said, beloved, I wish above everything else that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So there's prosperity, there's health. Health comes from good living. Bad living will produce poor health. And it's your own fault. Because you didn't believe God for something greater to get. I have a lot of supplements that I take. Vitamins and all. You call them vitamins, whatever. Supplements, all kinds of supplements. I spend the money to get those. Let's say if you wanted to fly a private jet, you say, well... It costs too much. It might cost $30,000 to fill the fuel tank. Well, if you don't have a million dollars, uh, you really can't spend that kind of money. But guess what? God is the God who'll give you the million dollars that you have the $30,000 to fill your airplane up. Just like he'll give you fuel for a car to fill it up. Just like he'll have you, give you the ability to go shopping. To do what? To take care of your life. To live in a good house. To have a good place. And God cares more about uh, his purpose coming through you than your own comfort or your own survival. There are millions of people in the world, billions even, that are struggling even to survive. And God cares about every one of them, but the, the way for them to get out of that is to discover their purpose. Every person that has a problem or a bad issue, every person that's struggling... In this world, there's a solution for that. Amen. But it's up to you to discover what it is. Yes. Does God change because there's a problem? No, he's still God. Are you still alive because there's a problem? Yeah, he gave us life. Now, especially for people that mean well or we would consider righteous, or people that are really the church of Jesus Christ, we, we, we want to see them get blessed. We want to see them helped. We want to see them have great things. You know? Not uh, suffer endlessly. Suffering comes from ignorance. That began to burden me. I began to think about that. Ignorance, you know? People living in ignorance. Yeah, some of you doing it. Some of you are doing it. 
ignorance, or you don't see something. You think something is, that's not okay is okay. No, there's a better thing to do. Someone said, well, I don't know if I can do it. Well, then, you, then you're the idiot, because you said that. You said it to yourself. God looks at you and goes, hmm, you say so? There you go. There's a principle that says whether you say you can or you can't, you're, you're right. If you say you can't, God won't even make you do it. He'll leave you there. Yes. Meanwhile, you're suffering. Everybody else is suffering. Yes. And nothing good is happening. Why? Because you did it. Yes. We say we want to be bishops and leaders and apostles. Get, get over it, man. Repent and take all the titles off your name. Take it off. I ain't calling you nothing. I'll call you my, my, my pastor or evangelist or... Uh, all these titles. Titles of, of what? Who gave you the title? You gave it to yourself. People that are powerful, they don't need a title. They just uh, You can just say their name. And their name stands for what they do in the world. What they do in life. Yeah. So here's somebody that has almost nothing. And they're calling themselves all this great. And God looks at you and goes, you're, you're a fool. You, you, you're a fool. You, you're, 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 you're in foolishness. So what's wrong with you? Just call yourself, hello, my name is Thomas. And my name, my life stands for a lot because we've touched millions of people around the world. We, I don't want to talk about myself at all. I want to teach the message here. I have no interest to promote myself. I have no interest to tell you what I've done or where I've been. No interest at all right now. Zero. I've made say nothing about it. When I've come and gone, afterwards you find out about me, you go, oh my God. This man was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To glory to God for all he's done through us. But the purpose and the assignment is what gets you the breakthrough. Because when you want to do the will of God, now his anointing gets attracted to you. His, he, he begins to show interest in you. He begins to look at you more intent, intently and attentively. Because he, he sees that you're serious about doing something for his kingdom and for him. You, you want to obey him. The Bible talks a lot about obedience. Talks a lot about sacrifice. Talks a lot about service. Obedience and service and serving and even persevering through hard times, all of that. Perseverance, long-suffering, the Bible calls it in Galatians 5, one of the fruits of the Spirit. You know, we need to walk in all that. But you're not supposed to endlessly suffer. Once you figure some things out and you get in the flow of the plan of God... <clears throat> now things begin to work well. You, you won't always be where you've been. God d does promote people. But you got to stay true to the flow and the message of what, you're, you know, what you believe. Do you know what? I preach about things that are great and huge and big no matter what I see around me. I've been doing it for years and I'll never stop. And when they manifest piece by piece, one by one, one after another, bigger and bigger and bigger... I, t I trace it back to when I didn't have it, didn't have that yet. But yet I still believed it as if it was all there. And God spoke these things to me prophetically. And he gave it to me also from his word. But he also spoke to me prophetically. What, was he lying? Was he telling stories? Was he telling tales? No, God doesn't tell lies. He can't lie. Numbers 23, 19 said he cannot lie. And he, then he said the next verse, he said, I've said it. Will it not come to pass? Will it not come forth? Numbers 23, 19. Look at it. Read it. And there's a scripture in Jeremiah said, it's not my word like a hammer. that breaks the rocks into pieces. Mark eleven twenty three 23 said, when you speak to the mountain, it can move away because you... Believe that it will move when you speak. You have faith and it will happen. God said in another place, I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? 
In the book of Luke, I think it's 137. Let's, let's, let's look at that. Luke 137. I think it's Luke 137. 137, 138, 139. Anyway, it's on my friend, the Archbishop's uh, uh, stage, you know, platform. It says, for God, with God, nothing shall be impossible. With God, nothing will be impossible. So he's not to blame. He didn't cause the problem for us. Other people did, and even us ourselves did it. So you have to discern and know who's right, who's wrong, who put this in my mind. And I changed my mind and say, it doesn't matter what came or what happened before. Now I'm going to change myself and my life from today. But it's all based on the will of God, the plan of action that he has, for you to know what it is, find out what it is, and get into it. I have a little teaching. I call it the five D's. Number one, you discern your calling. Discern means to see. It has to do with sight. Then second D, discover. You discover it by a process of discovery. Why? Going out and doing things. And getting into it and applying yourself to study. To learn things. And then the third thing you do is decide. You make a decision. The fourth D, to do it. And then it becomes... Number five, your destiny gets fulfilled. I'm okay, I'm okay, I got it. You discern, you discover, you decide, you do, and then it becomes your destiny. You're destined for greatness. You're destined for huge things. You're destined for great success. But it's up to you to begin to find it. And it's all based to the will of God. Even people in the world that don't know Jesus, they serve other gods or no God or they're total heathens. Some of them are even devils. They have devils in them. But in their mind, they were able to figure out what they wanted to do. And they went and did it, but they worked on something that was a talent and a gift that they had. Because all gifts and talents come to humanity from God. Every human has. When you're born in the earth, you're born with something. Whether you be sinner or saint. And no baby's born a saint or a sinner. They're just born. They just come out the way they are. They're a product of their environment. If you're in a sinful environment, the baby also is a sinner in a sinful environment. If it's a godly life, uh, the baby can understand about, begin to learn about righteousness. But every human still has to give their heart to the Lord. They still have to confess the Lord and receive Jesus as their own Savior to be born again. Every man, every, every woman, every boy, every girl, every human is born in the earth the way they are. Hello? And then you go on from there. People in the world even have the grace to succeed greatly in business, in life, financially, and they don't even know the Lord. But most people in the church, they're stuck and stupid and backwards. And this disturbs me greatly. Why do you say you know the King of Kings and you call your father Abraham, who was a multi-billionaire, you call your father David, David the King, who was a multi-billionaire, even a trillionaire, and Solomon, his son, who was a trillionaire, trillionaire in U.S. dollars. That's more than millions. That's more than billions. And you say that they're your father? You're, you're, you're joking. Father of who? Could, could you be living here and they're there? You have no connection. You didn't even read the Bible correctly. You read the scriptures about how Solomon had great wealth and treasures, and you go, oh. Okay, yeah. And you go on with your life. No, you should stop and say, uh, if, if God blessed him, God can bless me too. But what did Solomon do? First of all, he came from David. He learned from David, his father. He had a good environment. He wouldn't have been able to do what he did unless he had a good father. 
So you also have to watch the leader, uh, leadership, mentality, knowledge, understanding, revelation. You need to be with someone who has a lot of that. Then you can learn from that and say, okay, now I can adapt this into my system, into my life, and now we go on with this. I got very disturbed about that. So it's David, Solomon, Abraham, Moses. <laughs> These were giants. But I'm also a giant. And a giant killer. Why? Because God, the same God, lives in me. And the church is good at coming to church. The church is good at saying amen. The church is good at showing up and sitting in the chair, listening. But do they go out in the life and do anything with what they, what they should be learning? Not, not, not often enough. And this is disturbing. So the Lord began to speak to me about leaders, you know, other leaders that were supposed to help and train and raise up and see them. What a job. Oh, God. But it burdens me to see people living in ignorance. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. He used the word ignorant. That was concerning spiritual gifts, but I would say across the board, across the spectrum of life, God doesn't want us to be ignorant in any area of our life. The place where you don't have knowledge or revelation is the place where you'll stay stuck there. The thing that you don't understand is the thing you'll never have. But the Bible talks about the spirit of knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Wisdom is a principal thing in Proverbs 4, but he said, with it, get understanding. And in uh, Isaiah 11, verse 2, some of the attributes of the Holy Ghost were the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of understanding, and the spirit of counsel and might and the fear of the Lord. The, you know, the fear of the Lord is for you to take seriously the plan of God and say, I have to produce something with my life. Not this church thing, you know, people say, I oh, have the fear of God, the fear of the Lord. Oh, you, you're speaking about it in a mystical way that doesn't really apply. I'm very, I like to take it and make it practical that I understand what it means. What it means is I better get busy and get to work. Because God expects a lot of me. So if I fear him, as they say, the fear of the Lord, I need to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I got to get a lot done. Or else I'll never hear well done. You want to hear well done, my good and faithful servant. You're joking. You, you're joking. You're joking. You, you haven't done, if you haven't done anything at all, and you think you're going to be some great prince in heaven, or king in heaven, where? Foolishness. Ignorance. Delusion. You think you as a human in your stinking humanity are a great person when you haven't done anything to change the lives of the people in the world. And you think Jesus is going to say, well done. He's not going to say it to everybody. <laughs> and even those in Matthew 7, they said, did we not preach in your name, prophesy in your name, cast out devils in your name? Guess what? Sinners in the world, they don't do any of that. They don't even know what it is. They don't go to church. They don't preach. They don't prophesy. They don't cast out devils. What, are you kidding me? People in the world. So it's not talking to them. It's talking to the church. And Jesus said, I didn't even know you. I don't even know you. I don't even know you. You've done nothing good for me. So he said, go away into the, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, some preachers are going to hear that. You can't hide behind your glass piece of glass here. I could break this with one hammer and knock it down. I could hit it with a car and smash it into pieces. This here means absolutely nothing. Holding a cross up, saying, I, I have my Bible, praise the Lord. It doesn't shield you from anything. Not from God. And you know what keeps you from the devil is you applying the word and praying and putting a shield around your life, but also more so the hand of God and the blessing of God upon you. Like I said in Psalm 91, if you're in the secret place of the Most High, in the sh under the shadow of the Almighty, no evil can get you, can come, can, can, why? Because you're close to God. 
You're in his hand. You're in the secret place. You're with him. You're close with him. And the devil can't mess with him, so he can't mess with you. People do so little and they think they're so great. You're a, you're a, you're a legend in your own mind. Not in your own time. <laughs> you're a legend in your own mind. I passed a church. Someone should knock it down. In my view, I got very annoyed looking at it. I don't want to say too much because I'm trying to be a little bit polite. Uh, nice is not in the Bible, by the way. Nice, being nice. Nice is not in the Bible. The word nice is not in the Bible. Someone say nice is not in the Bible. Look from beginning to end in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. See if you find the word be nice. No. There's the law of kindness. Which means you, you treat somebody well because you also want to be treated well. That's different. Being nice to a devil, being nice to everybody, walking around like you have to be nice to everybody and you can't confront anything, you can't change anything. No, that's not in the Bible. But Jesus said, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. That's the law of kindness. Because you want someone to do good to you. So when you're good to others, always you're sowing a seed. You're sowing a good seed, and God sees that. Now, you're, you're releasing that in the world, and it, it, it can come back to you. Sowing and reaping. What a man sows. The Romans 6.6, 6, I think it is. I think it's Romans 6.6. 6. We could put it on the screen. Or is it Corinthians? I don't know. We'll find what, what word it is. It says, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If you sow evil, you're going to reap evil. If you give evil to someone, you're going to get evil back through some source. Maybe not from the person you did it to, especially if they're saved. They may say, I forgive you, and I won't kill you, even though you deserve it. I won't take revenge, even though you deserve it. But some other way, it's coming. Woe to the one who calls good evil and calls evil good. Is that Job 5.20? I think it's Job 5.20. I think it's Job 5.20. 5.20, I can't remember. It's the book of Job, I think so. Woe to the one who calls evil good and who calls evil. But more so, woe to the one who does evil. There's something coming back to them. You can't do that, do that, do that, and not reap it. So... That's on the bad side. On the good side, which is more important to talk about, is the more you do good for other people, you're sowing seed, and now God can reward you for that. Hello. No. No. Ephesians 6 8 says, Whatever thing you do for another man, that's good, but also bad. It's a principle. The same the Lord will do back for you. And it says it doesn't matter what situation you are in in life. Whatever you do for another will come back to you. Good or bad. The principle works both ways. But really, it's, he's, uh, Paul is trying to give the emphasis of doing good for other people. So he says, whatever good you do for another... The same the Lord will do back for you. Now, you can treat somebody well, and they may not treat you well. You can treat somebody very well, and they may not do you well at all. But that shouldn't concern you. You should look to the Lord of the harvest and say, Lord, I've been good, I've been good, I've been good, I've been sowing, I've been helping people, I've been doing the best what I can. The Lord says, I see that, and I'll honor you for that. But again, everything should be based on your calling. What is it God's called you to do? What is it he's gifted you to do? What, is, what skill has he put in you to produce something for the kingdom of God? What skill has he put in you? What anointing has he given you? What grace? What has he given you the mind and the heart to do, to understand how to do something? You need to do it as much as you can, and the Lord will bless you for that. Ephesians, uh, uh, Hebrews 6.10, Hebrews 6.10 says, 
God is not unjust to forget our labor. He'll bless us for that. He'll bless us for that. Boy, that kid is filming me on the tablet. You guys are brilliant. Young boys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Father, touch this new generation. Some adults, they, I don't know, they're stuck. I would rather they're not, but young people, I think there's a lot of hope for the young generation. I really, I feel, I feel that, I see that. More and more I'm seeing that. So ignorance in people is a tragic thing. I want to help to alleviate that. That's one of my assignments in the ministry. One of my assignments to teach. One of my assignments to help people understand things, that they can come up to a higher life, you know. And the things that God's already spoken to me, what projects to work on, what things he wants me to be doing, uh, these are the things I need to give myself to. But I can't do everything. There's a story, yeah, Lord, I, I, I'm reminded of an old man who uh, a great, had a great church, doing very well. And the day came when the church collapsed. Because he was building the church, going on, ministering to thousands of people, and then he got this other idea. Someone say other idea. Not good. And he's decided he's going to build a ho homes for the elderly and have a whole thing like that. Well, God wasn't in it for him to do that. And he lost money and he never got the thing finished right. And he diverted himself from what he was already supposed to be doing. And that collapsed, and the nothing worked out. His ministry collapsed. And he was a powerful guy who had a big church, thriving ministry, and at the end, he was just in, in utter dis destruction because he went off the way. Even Jehoshaphat in the Bible was uh, very successful. In fact, he was a multi-billionaire. <laughs> Not shillings, dollars. Jehoshaphat was a multi-billionaire. He had so much land. He had exotic animals. He had real estate. He had operations. He had gold. He had, uh, hey, these guys were rich, rich, rich men. Solomon was extremely wealthy, the richest one. Job was also a multi-billionaire. Did you know that? You didn't know that. Abraham was a multi-billionaire. Moses had to put his hand up to God and say, God, stop blessing us. It's too much. We can't process everything we have from you already. So please hold on a minute. Hold it with the blessings for a minute. You're giving us too much. We don't know how to manage all that you're giving us. Who around has that testimony? Nobody. Almost nobody. I know a few people, but not many. In fact, it's point zero 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 five hundred zeros, then one at the end percent of a hundred which is like <clears throat> one in five million. <laughs> Maybe uh, 150 million. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you have these crooks in business, crooks in the government, yeah? And they seem to have all this money, but they're going to hell. And when they get to hell, I hope they're happy. Because they're not going to enjoy anything. They're going to live in torment for, for forever. Because they're wicked criminals. Thieves, liars, and corrupt fools who take advantage of people. And they think that's okay. And everybody looks at them. Look at that guy with the big car. They have all this money. They bought this big house. All of that they will vacate and die and go down into flames of fire if they haven't repented and turned their life around. Which most of them never do. I know one guy, two guys, they were very evil. And one crossed me, one crossed, crossed the best up with me. He died, in a, he died in an accident, burned. He was dead in five seconds. The other guy dropped dead of a heart attack, just dropped dead. He had no chance to, to fix anything. Where did he go? Where did he go? He didn't go to heaven, that's for sure. He did not. Wicked, corrupt, lying, arrogant, money-grubbing, greedy, filthy, law-breaking, people-abusing, blank, blank, blank. 
But he didn't go to heaven. So don't envy people that are corrupted. The expression of God as far as success financially in every way should never be in the world alone. It should be in the church too. Sad to say some preachers maybe that seem to be doing well. Maybe they're not that straight either. But some are, thank God. I know some. One in particular, who's my friend, very, very holy, wonderful man of God, and he's very blessed financially. Oh, my God, he's blessed. But he's a giver, and he prays for people every day, and he preaches every day, and he's out there blessing multitudes of millions of people. All the time, he never stops. He's supposed to be rich. That's part of it. He's supposed to be very rich, not just rich, but very rich. Do you know God blessed Abram in Genesis 12, and the Bible says in the next chapter, 13, that he became very rich. But first, Abraham left everything he had and went to obey God, and then God honored him for that and made him very rich. So how many people do you know that are really doing well, but they're not crooks, they're not liars, they're not criminals, they're not crafty, they're not thieves, they're not very few. Why? Because they don't, people don't know, how to, uh, they don't know how to work right. They don't know how to... But it's all here. So I've written several books. One of them is here. I don't have much time to get into it, but this is here. And this is about living successfully. It's a great book. I have many other books. Uh, I, 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 people need to have knowledge. You know, the Bible says through knowledge, the just will be delivered. The Bible also says... Through lack of knowledge, people will be destroyed. And the Holy Spirit likened the knowledge to a, being a spirit. The spirit of knowledge and wisdom like a spirit. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, and the spirit of understanding. Meaning God himself can give these things to us. Lift your hand and say, Lord, I receive it all right now from you. If you catch it, it, your life will change, I'm telling you. Amen. So, discover your assignment, yes? yes? What it is God has given you as a mission for your life. What is that? If I ask you the question, what's your vision? What's your dream? What's your mission? Can you tell me quickly without thinking twice? Myself, I have a vision. I can say it in one sentence. To reach as many people with the word of the Lord and by every means possible, in the, uh, through every way possible, in the quickest ways possible, as much as we can, in the shortest amount of time. Boom, that's a little quick, quick snip of my vision. I have other parts to it. <clears throat> but I'm a messenger, I'm a revelator, I'm a teacher, I'm a trainer, I'm a prophet, I'm a pastor. Some have started to call me apostle. I don't need the title. It's okay. No problem. Manifestation of the glory of what God is doing is what's important to me. Because, you know, when you call someone something, that you should see that they're, they're really that. So I started to tell you about this church. And I don't want to say names or anything. But I, we passed by this place. And it says something, mountain, whatever. And it had the big picture of the the man on the, on the side of the thing and wearing a robe. Who does that? I mean, who does that? Really? I was like, ugh. I don't know how I got here today, but I'm, also, I'm glad I wasn't going there. I said, oh, now it's you. You're Jesus, right? Put your picture on the side of the wall. We have to look at you, you ugly self. We, do we care about you? You shouldn't even care about me. Care about the God in me. That's what we came to deliver something from him. Amen. Who I am is not important. <coughs> We're vessels. And this is a secret to success. You want to be a great minister. When you stand on the platform, people can see Jesus and feel the Holy Ghost and then receive his word and receive power and breakthrough and anointing. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. It's not about the vessel. 
We're earthen vessels carrying the glory, but the emphasis is the glory. My God, I feel the anointing falling here. Lift your hands and shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. You think people want to see you and care what your name is? For what? Come on, church. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. The old prayer, hide me behind the cross. Uh, uh, People will see you and don't be ashamed of yourself. I'm a great man. I'm a handsome man. Everybody likes me. I have a lot of great things about me. Yes, no problem. God made me like that. Amen. So I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to be seen. I'm not saying, oh, Lord, you know, it can't be me. Hide me. Oh, come on, stop that. But hide me behind the cross. Yes, that's good because it's the cross of Jesus because it's all about Jesus. You understand what I'm saying here? So the priority is him, his power. What is he doing? Where is he? Is he coming through you? Or not. That needs to be our focus. Now the way you get there. So I'm talking about a lot of things here. But the way you get there is to discover what God wants for you. Put your hand on your heart and just say, Lord, for me, for me. What what about me? God doesn't want you to live like one other person in the neighborhood, in the society. He wants you to stand out. He wants, his, he wants his own glory to come through you. Now your life will change in every way. So it starts with the seeing of what you're supposed to do and then discerning what you're supposed to be doing and then discovering by walking into it then deciding to obey, be obedient to the call and then doing it, doing it, working in it, working in it day and night and then your destiny gets fulfilled. Discern, discover, decide, do destiny. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a great destiny. Great destiny. Destination. I I fear God in the sense that when I get to the end of the road, I want to hear him say, well done. But guess what? I can never hear well done unless I well did. Hmm? Eh? Eh? It's quiet now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Let conviction come upon you. You can't hear, well done, my servant, unless you did well, and you were really his servant. Think about it. Think about that. So, Father, thank you for this word from your own heart today to your people. Training for reigning, how to live big, how to live in glory. You know what? The end of the road, if, even if we teach you about financial wealth, the wealth comes to then produce the, the advancement of the kingdom of God. Everything has the end in the will of God. Everything has its origin and ending in the will of God. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He perf- the scripture says, let's find that one and put it on the screen perfects those things that concern us. And then the other scripture, he who began a good work in you will perform it. God's concerned about the things that concern us, but for what? Just so we survive? No. But that we flourish in his plan, in his will, and what he wants us to be doing. This is where it's at. So, Lord, I pray for every person on the fire of God that they get busy. The Bible says the diligent hand makes rich. So the ultimate thing is to teach people about how to get money. You need money. I like money. Money's good. Money helps me when I need a lot of money in life. Money, money, money. It's wonderful. Don't be scared of money. Don't think you come up, you're never going to talk about money. Who made your head like that? The first person to talk about money should be the preacher. Hey, to teach people how to get more money (laughs) because you need it. (laughs) But if you're after money, oh, you're messing with God. I have no respect for you. I will not respect you ever. I will not. 
I'll see it. When I see it, I mark you. I'm done with you. We have no relationship. I don't want to be friends with you. I don't want to sit in your chair. I don't want to know you. Get away from me. Get away from me. Whatever stinking carnality and lust and greed and filth and satanic influence you have, I don't want it near me. Let me go all the way to the other side. If you're very slow and really super ignorant and you don't want to help anything and you don't want to apply yourself and you don't want to move forward in anything good, you're also a problem because you'll waste our time. You know, there's some people that can sit around somewhere forever and they'll never say anything. They'll never come up with any ideas. They'll never look at something and get disturbed and say, I question this. Can we fix this, please? I'm feeling disturbed. Something should be sorted out, fixed, solved. A solution has to be given. And can I be a part of that? Some people, they just sit there all day, all year, all month, and they never say anything. What is wrong with you? Whatever's wrong with you like that, I don't want it to be wrong with me. <laughs> My friend, Dr. Miles Monroe, bless his heart, he said something powerful. He said, if it's not working for you, I don't want it to not work for me. We're not going to have company together. If I look at your life and I see things that are endlessly not working, oh, I don't want that disease. You stay over there, I'll pray for you, but stay far away. Social distance. Not six feet, maybe 60 feet. <laughs> maybe six miles. The company you keep determines what you'll produce. You want people that are on fire. You want people that are brilliant. You want people that are saved. You want people to fill with the Holy Ghost. You want people that are full of the glory of God, but you want people that have, they should be full of ideas and solutions and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and power. And there are people like that. Lift your hands and say, Lord, give me the best people in my life. This is, this is how it works. This is how it works. Your environment. My friend, Dr. Mike Murdoch, says something powerful. He said, the environment, no, he said, the atmosphere you create determines the product you produce. If you have a great atmosphere, you'll produce great things. And I say this, you're invite, the Lord spoke to me this. This is my quotation. Thomas Manton IV, this is from Dr. Thomas Manton IV. The Lord said to me, and he said, tell my people this everywhere, and I've done it on all six continents of the world. 32 countries now. I'm disturbed that it's only 32, because I wanted to go to 60 by now. But we need to, we'll be flying again, and then I get to, maybe I'll break 100 by the time I'm done. I hope so. When I hear somebody say, I've been to 95 countries, I've been to 100 countries, I'm like, oh my God, I have some traveling to do. I feel challenged. Hey. Here's this thing that the Lord said to me. Your environment will either pollute you or promote you depending on what it is. If it's a great environment, It'll promote you because you'll be able to do more. You'll learn more. You'll know more. You'll see more. You'll produce more. You'll be activated to do bigger things. And that has to come with connection as well as who you have around you. Connection to the right people. I was in the elevator. At the, you call it the lift, whatever you call it, in this tall building and this morning. And the Lord said to me, uh, something in the lift, in the elevator. I was like, oh God, oh God, yeah. He began to speak to me two things about some people I need to have, which we will have right away. And he began to speak to me about, in a split second, a few seconds, God could speak very quickly and you get the point, he doesn't have to talk for an hour. 
To talk for an hour is to teach and to preach and to declare and to explain and to give examples and to give principles and scriptures. You know, hello. But God can give an instruction. He could do it in two seconds. So he said that. He told me the number of people. I said, yes. Okay. And then he said something else. He began to remind me about this thing about leaders, training leaders, helping leaders, which I've been a little bit reluctant about. But I feel like the time has come. We really need to step into that. I mean, really. This is something. I guess that's what you would call apostolic because you're, now you are become a father to people. You're fathering them. You're mentoring them. You're training them. You're helping them. You're a leader to them. You're a counselor to them. It's a big thing. So, we have a lot of work to do. Once God shows you your assignment, now you have to do all the work in all those departments. You have to find the money, or the money has to find you. I'm a firm believer that if you keep doing what God calls you to do, the money will come and find you. I don't have to look for money. Money's looking for me. I have to be conscious of how to create systems where money can flow, uh, of course, and we're working on that more too now, but the provision for the vision has to come because God can't give you a vision without giving you provision. He can't do it. Provision is for the vision. Pro, P-R-O, means for, F-O-R. Pro, I'm for it. Provision, money for the vision, resources for the vision, property for the vision, equipment and people and places and things that I need to produce the vision. I have to have it. And I need it now. God has to honor that. Supernaturally. It's very important because if you don't have any resources, you can't do the vision in this world. Because everything you, you do costs money. Everywhere you turn costs money. You see, when people in the church, they become so ignorant and so deceived. Let me, let me help you. You think even when a, a, a man of God starts talking in, these way, in this way right now, the last two minutes... You think, oh, now he wants something from me. You don't have anything. What do you have? What do you have? You sow it on the altar. Hello, and God will bless you for that. That's none of my business. If there's someone that has something big and you're even here, and God would speak to you to connect and it's sizable, I welcome that. Contact me. Get in touch with me. Fine. But every preacher, especially a man who's genuine, he understands the, hey, the money is for the vision. It's just part of the job. It's part of the work. I don't do this so I can get more. I know one guy, he's a crook. He's a liar. I know a few of them. And this guy has, hey, quiet, Psh Give me some person that to get that baby to be quiet. And this guy was going along, finding ways to take all this money from people and tell lies and all that. Do you know I saw a vision twice of his grave. The Holy Spirit showed me a grave site. He said it's for him. Did all that money that he did corrupt things to get, is it going to help him? Did it help him? And, and he can't even keep any of it. He's always struggling. And if he adds up, you add up all the money that was taken. I don't want to tell the whole story. It's, very, it's, very, it's a very strange uh, situation. Very bad situation. And he got all that. Did it help him? And someone like that, God won't even rescue them. 
If, they do, if he does, it's only for a purpose. Same guy, I prayed for him many times to be healed because he was ready to die, and he lived because of my prayer. He's still alive because of my prayer. He's still alive. But I saw a vision of his grave twice. So he has some decisions to make. And if he's alive for the purpose of that we end up getting something from the thing, fine. It's okay. We have to accept that. But the way of the sinner leads to destruction. So the quest to like get something, to get something, to gain something, what, what is that about? We need to gain God, the will of God. And I'm not separating prosperity from the spiritual realm. They go together. By the way, I'm very much into prosperity. I love it. I believe in it. I see it in the Bible. I write books about it. I'm a product of it. One noisemaker to a service, please. That would be me right now. One noisemaker alone. That, that, would be, that would be myself right now. Yes? All right. Okay. One noisemaker only, please, to a, to a meeting. All right. Now it's better. If you demons on these kids, I rebuke you in Jesus' name and leave them. Look at these babies. They're so beautiful. Hey, she's clapping. There you go. Great. She respond. I was looking at her and she just started clapping. You see that? The Holy Ghost. She's like, yeah. She's saying amen with her hands. Oh, yes. Her, her. Take a picture of her. She's a beautiful baby. Yeah, her. I said that. I looked at her. I was thinking about her. And then she just starts clapping. She's saying amen to that. Say, no demons can live in my house. Say, no demons can live in my house. Oh. No. No demons can be on my body. No. They can't be in my family. They can't be in my environment. No. My, my, myself and my house and my life is not for them. It's for God and his angels and the Holy Ghost and fire. And a great life. Part of a great life is to have prosperity, you know. These preachers, they, they're cro some people are crooks, they're liars. They act one way, but another way, they, it's something else. Do you know, even in America, the anti-prosperity guys, you know, the ones that get up with their religious whatever mindset and they speak against the preachers that are uh, uh, into sowing and reaping and the laws of faith and all that, they criticize them. Those same guys live in million-dollar houses. So we want to tell them, if you don't like prosperity... Give your car away. Get rid of your house. Go live in a little dump somewhere and live your poverty lifestyle. Okay with us. If you choose that, that's, your, that's for you. But don't criticize someone that's obeying God and helping people get blessed. And then you're also living like you. This one guy, he has, in California, he's criticizing ministries on, 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 on video, on whatever. And he has a church himself. You know, the guy has like three or four houses, and they're all multi-million dollar houses. You hypocrite. You're speaking against other people in the body of Christ, and yet you're living like that yourself. Hey, if you don't like prosperity, be true to your message. Go live in poverty. You think poverty's good? I was shocked when I was coming down here. I was shocked to the core of my life. I have never seen anything like this. I have never seen it. I don't understand it. I don't know how humans can get to the place where they can live like this. Lift your hands and say, we're getting out of here. What you're speaking about here, Lord, let it happen in my life. From today, in Jesus' name. You know, uh, poverty was never the plan of God. All the disorder, and it's the product of sin. It's the offspring of Satan and sin together. The father, Satan, and the mother, sin, come together and produce poverty. But it was never the plan of God. Never. Never was. 
Never can be. So I pray that you'll catch the fire from heaven from today. In Jesus' name. And live a big life. Because it's for you. And pastors, teach the people. Teach the people. Teach the people the principles. Learn them yourself. Study like 10 or 12 things in the week uh, before you have another meeting. And then write them down and say, okay, this is a principle of God. Let's apply it. This is a principle of the word of God. Well, let's apply it. This is something that God has shown me uh, is important for us to live a great life. Let's do this. And then, of course, I want to add a major part. And maybe we'll close with this one. Evangelism, world evangelism. I also saw something else. The Lord spoke to me about people. He spoke to me about leaders. He spoke to me then about uh, uh, having people get closer to God. Some people may already consider themselves a Christian, but they also then need to come to the altar to rededicate their life to Jesus. To, re to say, like, not just in a religious way, like for, you, <coughs> for fire insurance because you just hope you're saved, you know. But I mean to say, Lord, I'm going to commit myself to work with you. To do what it is you've ordained. Yeah. All right. So let's all, can we stand up now? And lift our hands to the Lord. And just lift your hands up right now. Let me pray for you. Father, every word. That's productive instruct, instruction for doctrine, understanding, instruction, and counsel, admonition, teaching. Let every word that's been spoken here take fruit and fruition in the life of every hearer. From today, let them feel convicted about where they are in life. Let them feel that, and look at things from outside, not just from inside themselves, but from an objective point of view. Let, let me look at my life and see how this looks. If many people, especially high-level people, looked at me, what would they think? Am I the expression of God? Hallelujah. This little girl, the call of God is on your life. This little one in the pink dress. Oh, my God. Shah, terebo, shayak. See the presence of God on you, dear. What is your name? Huh? Michelle. Michelle. That's a beautiful name. Lift your hands, Michelle. Jesus is visiting your life. Jesus is visiting your life. Thank you, Lord. The great call of God is on your life. You're going to see the power of God. Amen. Thank you, Father. Everybody lift your hands. I say the same thing for every person. That's here or that's listening. That you're going to produce great fruit. You know, Jesus came and asked for fruit of the fig tree. Fig tree had no choice to answer. When God comes and says, I want fruit, John 15, verse 16, the last verse of the 15th chapter of John, it said, I want you to produce fruit, and I want the fruit to remain. The Lord wants something coming from us that's tangible and real. So what? First the calling, then the obedience, then the work, then the diligence, because the Bible says, in Proverbs, let's put that on the screen. The diligent hand makes one to be rich. The diligent man will stand before great people. The diligent person will be blessed. The worker will be blessed. Now, some people work a job. I have to tell you, you can never get rich working on a job. Never. You'll just survive working on a job. You need to have your own enterprise. So, Father, let businesses be born. Let ministries be born. Let tangible systems be born. Let operations be put into place. 
that people can flourish and prosper in these days in Jesus' name. All right, more later. I love y'all. Can you blow me a kiss? Oh, thank you. You're very smart people. And you young people, you're very brilliant. I'm amazed at you. And for that, I'm glad I came. Lift your hands. Stretch your hands out toward me and say, Lord, what's on the prophet? By your power, come to me. Say what? The power of God. Say it. The power of God. That's on the life of your prophet. Come to me. And into me. In Jesus' name today. Right here, right now. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand and praise everybody. Come on, shout hallelujah. Let's shout. Woo! 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 Glory! All right. Father, I bless everybody in the name of Jesus. Let them see the hand of God. Let them see your mighty hand upon them. Let everything they put their hand to prosper. Let them take their hands off of anything you've not ordained. Let them get out of every place where they're not supposed to be. Let them get away from every person they're not supposed to be with. And change everything for the better. And those around us and people, places, things, events, systems, operations, people, environments, atmospheres, fix them all in Jesus' name from today in a new way. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise right now. Come on, somebody shout. Amen. Give the Lord another shout. Come on, it feels good. Hallelujah. Give God a shout. Glory, 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 glory. All right. All right. Father, thank you for the touch of heaven. Everything will change for the better from today because you have spoken here. And to you be all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name. I'm Thomas Manton IV. God bless you. I love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.